want to go and Cheers, get your friends and bring them. They won't want to miss it. We'll start in a few minutes. I think we're ready to go. Oh, well, Mike's going to be the automation, this. the okay. manual automation. Okay. I'll let you be over there. Huh? You're first. Okay. <coughs> wait for people to, to finish leaving. <laughs> Goodbye to Come our CTO. Back. Come back, yeah. I, okay. sta I stayed for yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, we're excited to be here talking again at uh, DrupalCon Prague. Um, in this session, we're talking about the Equip project. Uh, it's a pretty non-technical talk in terms of Drupal and technology, but there's a lot of domain-specific knowledge about uh, mental health. My name is Anthony Fox Davis. I'm the CEO at System Seeds. This is Elise West, who heads up our UX and um, led the Equip project. For some extra background, uh, System Seeds is a full service agency with a focus on Drupal and HCD, or uh, human centered design driven projects. We only go after social impact work because life is too short to make rich people richer. I think we can all agree on that. And Equip fits nicely into that definition of social impact. Over to me. Hi, I'm Elise. Nice to meet you. Um, I head up UX for System Seed. There's me with a glass of wine. That's how I'm happiest. I'll be like that later, hopefully, with chatting to you all. So, I was managing the human centered design and product strategy for this project, Equip. And it's been one of our largest projects, which we've been involved with from concept right through to launch. Now, I've been uh, managing the design and product strategy for every kind of industry you can imagine over the last 16 years. And I was only lucky enough to move into social impact work in the last five years. And I can't tell you the difference that I personally feel in my motivation to do my work and go to work in the morning with that change that I actually can have a positive impact on people's lives. Um, how many people in the audience are designers or work in user experience here. Two over there. Oh, a few. That's good. Good to see. So as you all know, our whole job is to know about people and understand what makes them tick. So when I used to work in the private sector for corporate companies, a lot of my day-to-day -day job was helping companies get people to get their credit cards out. How are we going to get them to buy the earrings to go with the suit or upgrade their hotel room? So going from that to what I do today, I can't really even describe the difference in how I feel about my day to day. So Equip was my first large social impact project, and it's a project that I feel incredibly passionate about. We're not on that slide yet. <laughs> Got to predict, surprise. Um, so yeah, so it's a project that I feel really passionate about. And it's been a real privilege, to be honest, to be on this journey with the WHO from where they wanted this to go to the impact that we've been having with this project today, which I'll start to describe when we start to talk more about it. How many of you have worked for an NGO or the UN? Lots of you, as it should be in the Drupal community. And how many of you don't yet work in social impact, but it's a space that you're interested in getting into? A few, one. So basically, I think for a lot of you that already work for social impact projects in the UN, there's things that we learned and things that we did on our journey that will probably sound very familiar to you. And for those of you that are looking to move into social impact, I hope that there'll be some information and some tips and tricks that will help you as well. So why talk about a case study today? What's in it for you? Well, obviously, not enough people thought there was a lot in it for them, but there is. So uh, for, for the video, it's not as crowded as we would like in this lovely big room. Um, so I've taught a lot of organizations over the years how to work in Agile and even more how to focus on the user, human-centered design, which is something we'll talk more about a bit later on. And every time we have new clients come to us, I hand on heart commit to them that they will have a significant positive impact by focusing on their users' needs. So that really is what I want you to take away from today, that if you change your ways of working, and if you really look at a human-centered design process first and foremost, your projects and products will be more successful. 
And if you don't, probably your projects will fail. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. So equip. What is equip? Equip stands for ensuring quality in psychological support. But what does that really mean in layman's, layperson's terms? Next slide. So basically, the basic premise is to train and assess people in humanitarian settings that have no background in mental health care. But why do this? Why do we even want to go there? So basically, in high poverty areas and humanitarian emergencies, at least 97% of people suffering from depression or in, with other mental health problems receive absolutely no mental health care or support. Now, that alone is a shocking statistic, but I want to bring it even further home with another stat from War Child that I saw recently. Um, in the Gaza Strip right now, four out of five children are suffering from severe depression, fear, and grief, and have absolutely no access to any mental health care at all. So I'll just let that sink in. And this is an issue that NGOs have been struggling with, global NGOs have been struggling with for years. And how can they really scale, I think it's the next slide, how can they scale this ability to give support? There just basically is not enough psychiatrists and psychologists, and even more so in humanitarian settings. So this was really where Equip came in and how Equip was created. So the goal for Equip and the two main goals for the WHO, now in partnership with UNICEF and funded by USAID, is number one, as I've just said, is to increase the number of people, the number of non-specialists who are safe and able to give mental health support. And secondly, eventually, to become the standard tool, the standard platform to train and assess all people for the fundamental mental health interventions. So before we go any further and before I talk through the details of what we did and, and how that's interesting for you, I just want to go through a few terms that for those of you that have worked a lot for NGOs, these probably seem quite familiar, but it will just help for the details that we'll go through. So uh, these are all different user types that we broach all the time. So a helper is basically the person I've been talking about. It's the non-specialist, the person with no mental health background who is being trained to give mental health support. So those generally are people, to understand why are these people doing this, they're often volunteers in their community that have seen the destruction and cause of, in their community of severe depression, post-trauma and post-war, or um, if there's a, a bad level of substance use, and they want to help. Or they could be professionals that work with the community but have no mental health experience. So teachers, pharmacists, police officers, etc. to give some examples. And a client. A client is the person in need of mental health services. So basically what we would normally refer to as a patient. And a trainer. So a trainer is a person normally employed by NGOs who is a mental health expert who is training the non-specialists in the mental health skills that they need. So normally a psychologist or a psychiatrist in the area. Over to you. So why Drupal? <coughs> why are we presenting about Equip at DrupalCon? Well, the executive summary would read, it's open source and it's scalable. Um, first, let's talk about open source. When we first talked to uh, stakeholders about technology choices and systems architecture, they immediately knew that open source would help them in the following ways. It would make it easier to get project sign-off through legal. It would mean that the project can easily move between departments, which is a very common occurrence in the UN, uh, where one takes over ownership from another. And it means that partner organizations could also share or transfer ownership or easily fork the project code base. Obviously, Drupal is open source, but how else did it benefit Equip? Um, honestly, I've never considered Drupal uh, to be specifically cheap 
or fast to use for MVPs, and this project was to be iterative, starting with an MVP or a minimum viable product. But our engineering team's always up for a challenge, um, so we set them one, to quickly build an MVP while also laying the foundations for scalable architecture. Um, in human-centered design, the faster you can show results, even for the smallest thing, the faster you can go back and talk about future budgets. As I say, this is an iterative project, um, which is obviously great for project longevity. So we knew uh, no-code prototypes showing a proof of concept needed to be quickly followed by an MVP uh, for users in the field, uh, real beta users. By design, this MVP was built for English-speaking users, but we knew that the future of Equip meant supporting more of the official languages of the UN, as well as the less common languages um, native to where Equip was going to be rolled out. These included Arabic, a right-to-left language, obviously, which meant that page layout uh, adaptation was crucial. Uh, included the language of Tigrinya. Uh, this is a new one to me, and that has its own alphabet, which is spoken by the global diaspora of people from Ethiopia and Eritrea. Uh, had support Nepali and others as well. One important consideration we had around being ready to scale into these regions was not just about adaptation of language and layout, but about regional content as well. Here's an example of why that's important. In the UK and in much of Europe, making eye contact uh, is used as a way to show you you're being attentive, you're looking to make a connection and empathize um, when, when pe uh, pe people are speaking. In these, countries, uh, in these countries, a therapist or psychologist might use eye contact as a way to form trust with patients. But in some African and Middle Eastern countries, eye contact can be considered rude cultural difference. And a psychologist using eye contact with patients would get the opposite of that desired effect. In some regions, even the word depression needed to be adapted to be understood by the helper receiving the training. That's not, it's not in the dictionary. Um, let's talk about internationalization. To achieve all of this, we use Drupal Core's translation modules and translation management tool to go multilingual and roll out regional specific content in one sprint. Uh, we went from supporting one language to four in two weeks. I think now is a very good time to say thank you to Drupal for making that possible. Also, we wanted admins to feel good about the UX and UI in their back end, uh, in, in specifically in the workflows of their back end. They needed something that looked and felt great. And in the past, Drupal wasn't exactly famed for its user-friendly admin UX. So we had some work to do there. We used the Claro theme and customized it to help guide the admin's UX. And through roles and permissions, we tried to hide all of the irrelevant features and all of the navigation items that ad admins didn't really need to see. The end result was actually quite a slick and crisp UI and UX that made a good first impression on new site admins, very important. And it put their equip-specific forms front and center in those workflows. So human-centered design, which I've mentioned a couple of times, has been core to the success of this project. Because at the end of the day, understanding the people that are going to use the tool that we're producing has to be the forefront of everything we're going on to develop. And I hope after this talk, it will be the forefront of everything you go on to develop. So what is human-centered design? It's basic. Oh, that just flipped. Oh, uh, next slide. No, next one, sorry. Um, it's basically the focus is understanding the perspective of the person who is experiencing the problem and finding a solution that meets their needs, solves that problem. So let's talk a little bit about when we don't do this, what happens when human-centered design is ignored. And this is a real example. So this was a campaign in the US with the strap line, too cool to do drugs, went on every pencil in every school in the US. And they didn't really think about the end user, the student. They thought, yeah, great, we've got these pencils. Students write with pencils. What else do they do when they've written for a while is they sharpen the pencils. And so very quickly, that strap line became cool to do drugs or just do drugs not quite the impact I think they were looking to have. 
So back to our human-centered design processes where we actually do do it right. And we always kick off, we always start with a workshop where we get everyone into one room together. So that's our stakeholders. During the research phase, that was the WHO, George Washington University, and eight NGOs around the world that were helping us with the research. And it was also our team, so not just me, but our designers, our developers. We were all involved, all in one room. And this is an opportunity for us to do many visual exercises with the stakeholders and the co-design wireframes. And it really helps the stakeholders go from a, well, we need everything for all users straight away. It's got to just do everything, that kind of typical mindset, to starting to understand, well, who are the most important, the target users we need to meet their needs first? And which needs do we need to meet first? As well as that, it's a great opportunity to build trust with the stakeholders and really get them to lean into the HCD, the human-centered design process. So after a workshop of five days, and I have to say that the, the stakeholders were very reticent that we were making a digital tool for this. It wasn't like a, yay, we're here and we want to do this. So just before I move on to these quotes, to give one example, at the very beginning, and I did exactly this, I introduced human-centered design and what we would be doing. And the lead of Warchild, a very important man, who has headed up a lot of this research, literally just said, I don't want to do this and I don't want to be here. I've been using pen and paper for years. This is pointless. But regardless, he was under contract with the WHO, so he had to stay, which was lucky for me. Because by the end of five days, it was a real change. Two statements like this. This will aggregate all of my data for me. And my colleagues can see all of the assessment results without me having to do any extra work. And now beyond some of the other impact that a quick can have, saving, saving time for any of us is great, right? But saving time in NGOs is astounding. Before meeting all these different NGOs, I couldn't really grasp how understaffed they truly were. So to give just one example, HealthRight, which is an organization in Uganda, have just two staff training hundreds of helpers every week in the whole of northern Uganda. I mean, I just couldn't even get my head around. I kept going, well, where, where are the others? You have a team, right? No, it's just us. It's like, OK. Um, so going back to the war child scenario, they are now our most active users, so much so that they now train other smaller organizations in how to use Equip because they want it to scale. And they literally phone us often asking, we've got more interventions, please put them into Equip. We really don't want to use pen and paper. So seeing that kind of impact and that kind of change of viewpoint for people that really are not digital natives, are used to using pen and paper, was, was really exciting for us. It was a game changer for, for us and for them, right? So once we'd had that workshop and we had some concepts in place, we went away and we prepared code-free interactive prototypes. Now, the code-free aspect is super important because we're looking to do this as cheaply and quickly as possible. There's still so much we don't know, so we don't want to waste budget on months of development at this stage. So once we had these interactive prototypes ready, the George Washington University team and myself went into the field to do research with the prototypes in real trainings, real assessments. So we went to Lebanon, Peru, Uganda, Ethiopia and Nepal. And we used the prototype, and we were like, pretend you're doing a real assessment. Well, actually, do a real assessment, but pretend this is already the real tool and assess with it. Obviously, as you can imagine, doing that kind of testing in the field was invaluable. And we really found some blockers and, and engagement flows that we needed to fix. But we also found some quite surprising results that we couldn't have predicted. So to give some examples, some of the user flows or labels or icons that you and I are super used to using on our iPads or Android phones were really not working for them. If you're not a digital native, we needed some things to just be made clearer and done in a different way. 
But the great thing was we could literally adapt the prototypes there and then on the go, test again until we knew it was right. And again, the same as with the stakeholders, a group of very non-digital native people, when we first arrived, the whole idea that we were making this digital tool, they were, they were definitely reticent. And by the end, they were both excited and they were asking, you know, when's the real thing going to be ready? I want to use it for my next training. So it was really great to see that enthusiasm. So how does, well, I've talked very briefly about Agile, but how does this human-centered design approach, the discovery process, fit with Agile development? Well, it actually fits perfectly. Because in both cases, we're looking for the smallest iteration that can meet the user's needs, measure the impact, check we're on the right path, and then loop around. So it's a constant loop of HCD discovery through to agile development, measuring, and then on we go. So I'm going to talk about iterating for a moment. Um, most of my experience in technology has been in management. And when I learned about agile, for me, it was mind blowing. Um, nowadays, I coach Agile with our clients, and oops, sorry. Uh, nowadays, I coach Agile with our clients, and I feel it's really key to our project successes. So, why is it such a strong tool? Have we got the iterations? That's it. Um, a few reasons: you start by prioritizing, and specifically, you start by prioritizing your time. We set minimum Agile ceremonies, like sprint planning, sprint review, retro, and a daily stand-up. And we time box those to make sure we spend that time wisely. And just that in itself helps cut extraneous costs. Right? There's too many long, uh, unlimited length meetings that go on. And that costs the client money. It costs the project. Um, it also helps us focus on delivery. The more time we have back, the more that we can build something and get it out. Uh, this focus was so important, given that we needed to get things out quickly to real users. Is it me already? So Agile is obviously great for shifting needs, but it is especially prevalent, especially needed when COVID hit, right? So at this point, we were deep into sprints, uh, dealing with iterations for the assessment tool. And they couldn't run, the NGOs couldn't run in-person trainings or assessments, which, by the way, was everything we designed up to that point was for in-person trainings and assessment. But even worse than that was they couldn't support their current clients who they normally supported by being in one room. So we were having NGOs calling us going, I know we're meant to be testing out the trainings and the assessments, but honestly, we don't know what to do because we've got our current clients and we can't support them. We don't know how to do that remotely. So this is where the project pivoted. No one? There we go, stop. Right. <laughs> so uh, we moved from a focus on the assessment feature that was going through MVP trials in the field to bolstering our open source Drupal-based LMS that SystemC had built in the past. Our LMS is called ANU and is used by other WHO projects as well as Equip. And it's used by other social impact and NGO organizations around the world. ANU runs as a PWA, a progressive web app. And uh, this was originally so that we could keep a single code base and not build a separate native app for field users who wanted to use tablets. They wanted a large screen real estate, and uh, you had to uh, add data, collect data, um, keep it local before you could get back into internet connectivity. This choice actually turned into a real blessing when the pivots occurred, and ANU was core to uh, the offering via browsers on the web. Another pivot was for our own editor team to prioritize enhancing the LMS course content. This allowed NGO staff to continue delivering urgent remote support to clients online as opposed to tablets in the field. So the impact of Equip, so I talked a lot at the beginning that I promised clients that they will have a positive impact. So let's talk about the impact that Equip has had so far. So Equip was launched to the public in May, so pretty recently, and we've already seen active use of Equip in 46 countries. 
We have over a thousand monthly active users already and hundreds, thousands of helpers already being trained. Now, a thousand monthly active users, for those of you working in the pri private sector, doesn't sound that amazing. But in NGO world, this really is already fantastic. The WHO and these NGOs don't have big sales and marketing budgets. So most of this number of users already is just from NGO to NGO word of mouth. As well as that, the WHO has already measured an 18% increase in the safety and ability of helpers trained with Equip compared to standard trainings before. Now, obviously now, data aggregation is immediate. I talked before about how understaffed NGOs are. Before, they were having to use multiple employees to aggregate the data from various trainings, multiple assessments per training, send them to their headquarters where they were aggregated further. All of that is now just done by the platform. The USAID are so pleased with the results so far of Equip that they've agreed to fund the fourth year in a row for Equip. So as well as the, the data on a more analytical level, we also obviously touch base and find out information from our, our users in the field all the time to check that this is working well for them. And rather than go through data points, which we have many of, I'd rather give you one story, one example of talking to different people in the field. So I was actually there at the time when this happened in Uganda uh, with HealthRight. HealthRight are an organization that focus on post-war, post-severe trauma depression. And Josephine is the director for Uganda. And she was about to run a 10-day training for 20 volunteers who wanted to become helpers. And I was there just to watch and check how Equip was being used and how we could further refine it. Now, I have to say, at the beginning of this training on day one, Josephine looked pretty despairing. These volunteers were going to be hard to train. They were starting from a place of literally zero understanding or knowledge of depression, and due to many cultural reasons, a total stigma about discussing mental health at all. As well as that, there were societal norms for the area that we were in that meant that the women in the group, the women volunteers, really struggled and were very uncomfortable to look anyone in the face, never mind eyes, at all when they were practicing to support and would often kneel in front of people, especially their male counterparts. So Josephine felt this was going to be pretty hopeless, but regardless, we were like, let's, let's go ahead and see what happens. At the end of 10 days, using Equip for the training and then using Equip for the assessment, I was there when Josephine was literally in tears. And she was in tears because she was so moved to see this group of people able to support people, understanding how to be effective and safe helpers, and she couldn't believe it. Now, I talked before about the emotive elements of social impact work in general, but also how passionate I am about this project. And I can't really describe a moment like that where you get to see that happen for a project that you've designed, that you are part of a team developing. It was really an amazing moment, an amazing uh, moment to know why you do you, the job that you do, right? So as well as talking to the trainers in the field, we also spoke to uh, the people being trained, the people that were becoming helpers to get their feedback. And again, I have just one example that I'd like to give of many examples from one helper who was uh, being trained with Socios en Salud, which is Partners in Health, in Peru. And I'm just going to read this quote. I was able to support my neighbor who lost her husband to COVID and was dealing with profound grief. She has now started to get back to her routine and engage with her family. I'm so grateful to have these skills that enable, enable me to support my community, particularly at a time when the mental health of so many people has been impacted by the pandemic. Um, as well as that, already um, Equip has been uh, widely featured in various publications. I'm only going to name a few. Cambridge University Press, Scientific American, 
uh, many others, we get very excited and it's all over our Slack when it happens, but uh, just so that you, you know it's out there and a lot of NGOs have started to, to know about it and use it. Before we wrap up, there's a couple of things. First of all, I want to thank the Equip team that have been involved in this project. It's been, over the last four years, an emotional ride for all of us, and we've all felt just as passionate as I do about it, work super hard on it. So if, if the people that are on Equip want to stand up for a moment, give a wave. Give a wave, go on. Kate, Bran, <laughs> Ali, <laughs> Ali, thank you. There are more for out there on our stand as well, but I just want to say a big thank you because I know it's been a project we all feel so strongly about. As well as that, if you remember what I said at the beginning about what I promised clients and what I hope you have had from this talk, I hope you go away from this talk and you are more interested in really thinking about and solidifying the idea of thinking about your user first, serving your user and what do they need, what problem are you solving for them, to really have both successful projects, but also if you're working in the social impact space, to be able to really impact people's lives positively. That's what it's all about. Obviously, on that note, any of you that are like, that sounds super interesting, but we're a group of developers, we're here to support you. Feel free to, to come and discuss with us what we can do for you to help on your human-centered design processes. And our stand is just opposite the photo booth, just outside. So we're going to watch this video. It's in Spanish, but it has subtitles. It's just a couple of minutes long. That's a link. Ah, shit. We had a link. We no longer have a link. Give us one moment. In the Google Slides, it's a link if you use that. sound? Have we got any sound? fortalece las habilidades de los profesionales especializados y no especializados en la prestación de servicios de salud mental, específicamente en mujeres gestantes de la zona norte de Lima Metropolitana. Tener a la plataforma Equip en nuestra intervención. Para mejorar el entrenamiento a proveedores no especializados, es decir, agentes comunitarios de salud y proveedores especializados en salud mental. Asimismo, fue de gran utilidad el hecho de que se implemente durante las atenciones en la comunidad. Profesionales especializados entrenan virtualmente a las agentes comunitarias de salud usando la plataforma Equip. Una vez culminado el entrenamiento, las agentes comunitarias de salud son evaluadas y acompañadas en el uso de las habilidades aprendidas durante las sesiones con las gestantes. Con Equip podemos seguir el progreso del participante y realizar feedback en el momento que más lo necesiten y en tiempo real. Esto ha sido de gran ayuda durante la implementación del proyecto. La experiencia en el uso de la plataforma Equip demuestra que su implementación incrementa la calidad de los servicios prestados por parte de las agentes comunitarias de salud. Por otro lado, considerando que el cuidado integral de la salud mental materna es importante, se procura establecer espacios que vinculen a las comunidades con los establecimientos de salud u otras instituciones de apoyo. Por este motivo, se espera que la plataforma Equip escale a las instituciones públicas y privadas. De esta manera garantizamos que esta plataforma llegue a organizaciones que brinden atención a las personas que necesitan una atención en salud mental. 
Socios en Salud pretende establecer alianzas con el Ministerio de Salud y otras ONG para que se implemente a nivel nacional y ser un país referente a nivel de Latinoamérica. Continuamos trabajando para brindar atención de calidad en salud mental. I don't know about you, but I find that very moving. Um, that's a wrap. Uh, if you enjoy the talk, you can rate us on the session survey. Um, just a reminder that there's a contribution day on Fridays. ANU is open source, our LMS, if anyone would like to contribute to ANU. There's other contribution days scattered throughout the week here at DrupalCon. Also, we, also we have a stand. Uh, please come and say hello to us. We can't wait to meet you all properly. It's S14 opposite the, uh, the photo booth. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the time at DrupalCon this week. Goodbye. Are there any questions before we go? One second, um, sorry. Can we grab that for the people watching online? Who asked the question? Ah, OK, sorry. There's people watching online, so. Hi, I, I was curious as what was the LMS platform if you use the Opinio Drupal distribution for LMS? We, we created um, ANU ourselves, so it's not based on another Drupal platform. Um, it really had to be flexible, and we didn't want to be bound by someone else's roadmap. Um, so it uses a great deal of um, Drupal contrib modules, so we try to not fork from what the rest of the community is doing as a whole, but we prefer the building blocks rather than someone else's complete package. And, and just to add to that, for especially for the UM, because we now use this LMS for, ver LMS for various UM projects, and it really has some elements that really lends itself now to their needs. So it's been excellent in that way that I haven't really seen off-the-shelf LMSs be able to do for us. And how long did it take you to build that? Um, okay, so this, this is a, a trick you might want to employ in your own agencies or dev teams. Uh, we told our CTO to go away and come back in two weeks, and he wasn't allowed to talk to anyone else in the company. <laughs> two weeks, we shut him in a cave, we called it the cave, and he came back and had built the fundamentals with a roadmap as to what would come at specific times and what community contrib modules would be incorporated at the right times, depending on the, uh, the feature roadmap. So two weeks, lock uh, away your CTO, he can c create great, great <laughs> things. And now we iterate on it all the time, right? Yeah. But we iterate based on what real users need, not, not on a bubble of our own guesses, which is what's important. Any uh, other? I do have a question. So you talked about multilingual capabilities. So have you provided this to the admin side as well? Can you Drupal repeat that, admin. The, Have we provided the admin side? Yeah, so to the admin, to the content editors on the admin side. Have you so provided oh. the multilingual capabilities there? Yes, we have, in, is the short answer. But it has been really an interesting journey, right? Because obviously, uh, NGOs and the WHO have uh, restricted budgets on how much they can spend. And if we went full whack with every desired thing on the admin side, we'd end up with the same amount of money spent as on, on the front end, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we had to be very, and, and again, we're dealing with a lot of non-digital natives who are content admins and admins on different levels. But yes, we've built in various elements and the multilingual element on the admin side as well. Okay, that's, that's what, great. what we found was helpful, um, when we started talking to senior stakeholders at the WHO, they mentioned many different projects that would benefit from an LMS. And what we did is we started to talk to other um, uh, uh, projects. It's actually within the same mental health department of the, the UN, WHO. But um, what we found was feature commonality that people were requesting. And so when we went to build something, we specifically went to build it in a generic way. And uh, we, we talked to other ongoing projects to get feedback from all of them so that they had not just one shareable distribution, <clears throat> but they could do feature switching. So <clears throat> when ANU is used in different projects, it may not have all of the same projects as the neighboring uh, application of ANU, but when we build once, it's ready for reuse. Maybe I'll connect with you later because I do have more questions. So I would love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? 
the same for everyone. Feel free to come over us, uh, to our stand. There is jam and, uh, <laughs> and other gifts. And then if you do have more questions or want to chat more deeply about the project, then do come over. Tam. I don't know everyone's name. This is a stage from our company. <laughs> this, this question is prepared. Um, would there be an opportunity, potentially tomorrow, for people who are interested in LMSs to join a Birds of a Feather session, <laughs> maybe led by Kate? <laughs> it's funny. This Who's is just Kate. over there? What a coincidence. Um, yeah. You now have to say that all over again with the microphone. Yeah. It's coming well, in. Well, it way. doesn't matter for the recording. No, it's, that's it's an true. in-person event that's tomorrow. That's true. Right, but fine. tomorrow, at what time did you say? At one o'clock. Eleven thirty. Tomorrow at eleven thirty. More discussion specifically about the Anu LMS. Very good. Thank oh, you for that. One, time. one final question. If the microphone can get over that. Thank you. So I actually have a bunch, but I'll just narrow it to one. So as a product designer, I really focus on accessibility and knowing the type of work that you do. I'm wondering how you were able to integrate accessibility in Equipped, or is that in the future? If it, because I know budget and timeline is very challenging. Yeah, so if you could talk about that. That's a great question, and I'll answer it briefly, but I would recommend that you come over to our stand to discuss it in more depth with Alejandra, who is our specialist, who's just here. But on, on the brief answer to that at the moment is, yes, we've built some elements of accessibility in, and it has to be, right, on a standard for the UN, it, it's not really acceptable not to. But you're also right that within the budgets, the level that we would like to isn't always possible. But what we try and do on an agile level is within the same stories, when we're looking at this is the user behavior we would expect in this story, we also put, and this is the behavior we would expect on an accessibility level. Now, on a design level, we all know to design in a way that's accessibility friendly. I think that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.